this garden I've got uh, potatoes planted all around the perimeter here and then down the center I've got uh, I've got beans planted under this plastic right because it's still getting cold at night <clears throat> hey it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com and uh, I thought I'd do a video today speaking to a viewer question. Someone asked me to do a video on my, my process. I think it was my, my understanding of the question is just how do you go about, you know, from day to day doing particular things in your garden? What's your process for just managing your garden? I think that was the gist of the question. So uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take you around and show you a couple things I've, I've planted and, and how some things are working. And it's not exactly a garden tour, but. Uh, uh, similar in certain respects, um, but uh, I guess to start with as you can see uh, the, the black flies are unbelievably bad Normally I do all my gardening Really early in the morning or really late at night this time of year when the black flies show up. I don't like being in the garden with them uh, There isn't one remedy for black flies that I found to be effective Aside of wearing one of those complete bug suits, and I hate being I hate those suits. I, I don't know why. I feel really confined in them. I just don't like them. So uh, uh, I just work around the flies. Um, but if I have to come out with the flies, I, I, I usually come out with this guy. And I, actually, in most of my videos, I usually have a ball cap on. But most of the time when I'm working in the garden, I'm actually wearing this hat. I, I just don't wear it on my videos because I think I look like an idiot in this hat. <laughs> just one more middle-aged douchebag wearing a Tilly hat. So I, I, I don't wear it. <laughs> I just don't like the way I look in this thing. Um, but it's a very effective hat for keeping the sun off. And even when the flies are bad, for some reason it works better than a ball cap. I think they attack the top. I don't know. Anyway, I spray this whole thing with muscal and, uh, you know, I have like a thing covering my ears so the flies can't get in my ears. And I try to keep my eyes sort of squinted so they don't go in my eyes. And I try to breathe really shallow. I find it's if you're going to take a deep breath, you sort of move. You sort of move off to the side a bit and take a breath. <laughs> so, but generally speaking, I, I just try not to be in the garden when the flies are in the garden. And uh, lots of people over the years have given me all these different solutions for black flies. And I know they come from, uh, from Goodwill and that sort of thing, but I think a lot of people just don't really understand uh, what it's really like being near a forest with real serious uh, forest black flies <laughs> you just can't breathe um, and I guess to that effect and in one of my recent podcasts uh, we talked about those those new shirts you can buy that are supposed to uh, deal with flies I bought one of those they cost like uh, 80 bucks they've got some chemical in them supposed to prevent flies they do nothing nothing do not buy don't waste your money uh, you know th this they basically keep the flies from biting your shirt and I'm not, getting, not, I'm not getting bit on my sweater right now, right? There. So you put the shirt on and the flies attack your hands and your face. And they go in your ears and they go in your nose and they go in your eyes. <laughs> the shirt does nothing. I, I wore it here um, Thursday and Friday last week when I was putting uh, all the sand in. Did nothing. And then I went on a fishing trip last few days. I was out in the woods, in the deep woods with insane flies. And the shirt did nothing. <laughs> nothing. So... <laughs> Aside from keeping flies from biting me through the shirt, which if you have a heavy enough shirt on that doesn't happen anyway At least with black flies So yeah, don't waste your money uh, If you think that's solving your fly problem, you probably don't have a real fly problem would be my advice Anyway, I'm gonna take you around and show you uh, some things here. So uh, come along. All right I guess the first thing to show here is just uh, I always try to get a couple kinds of greens started really early and we had a terrible Terrible April and terrible May in terms of growing conditions. Not a lot of sun. A lot of overcast days. But I still managed to get some some greens going. Under this, under this cold frame. Alright, so this is uh, uh, Swiss chard, um, spinach, a little lettuce. That's basically it. Lettuce, Swiss chard, and spinach. A bit of bug damage here. I haven't really done anything here. Actually, the soil's moist. I have not watered this for two weeks, and the dome's been on for two weeks, so it hasn't really been rained on. But uh, there still seems to be water in here anyway. Uh, these are 
<laughs> uh, parsnips from last year don't need to be there. Yes, I know they'll go to seed, but I've got other ones going to seed elsewhere. I don't want parsnips going to seed here. Anyway, so part of my process is to have some something early, and I really don't bother too much with the weeding, especially on a day like today when the flies are bad. I, I can't think of a worse thing to do when the flies are bad than weeding. I only do what's necessary if I'm in, out in the garden when the flies are bad. Anyway, some of the spinach is getting big enough to pick, and uh, some of the lettuces. So, yeah, first part of the process is to have some early success. So I like to plant, I planted these the uh, end of March. And, uh, yeah, they're coming in good. I gotta, what I gotta do now, if we're gonna talk about process, is uh, I think uh, this week we got a string of rainy days coming up. So I have to take, you can see that they're not growing everywhere, but there's certain enough plants to fill a bed here. So I gotta take these plants and move them around. I mean, I sowed them and they grew, they grew where they grew. But now, uh, I gotta, I gotta change the spacing. So I'll just, using a spoon, a scoop, just pop these out and put them where they belong. I'll fill in this space here. I'll fill in the space at the end. The garden's 10 feet long, but the dome's only eight feet long. So I'll fill in those spaces. And in a few weeks, this will look completely different, but all these same plants will just be redistributed to use the space properly, right? So that's, it's, it's like, uh, it's like doing transplants only uh, I'm just moving plants that were growing outside the whole time so they, they adapt a lot quicker. Uh, if you can move them on, like let's say you got a, a string of overcast or rainy days, maybe three days. Uh, if you move them properly and they don't bare root them, um, they're, they're basically completely recovered and completely adapted in a matter of days. Because they're, they're staying in the same conditions and they're, go, they're staying in the same soil, right? They don't have the same... Uh, amount of uh, adaptation to do as opposed to being brought from a nursery to your garden or brought from indoors to outdoors or whatever. I've been outdoors the whole time and there's been some days when it's a nice day and it's warm and there's a bit of rain I'll take this off um, so to let the you know direct sunlight at them and so on and so forth so yeah in terms of process this garden has to be moved around a bit to make use of the space so uh, I'll do that maybe early tomorrow morning when the flies aren't around. <laughs> Here's a good thing to show. Uh, this is my plan for today, if the flies don't drive me mad, is to uh, is to sow my uh, cucumbers and squash and stuff like that. Um, it's still a bit cold, but I'm going to sow them under plastic, so it's a little bit different of a game, right? You can. Um, and the normal rule of thumb I use for planting the heat-loving things like squash and uh, uh, beans and stuff like that is I wait till the petals fall off a tulip plant. I seem to find I find that seems to be a good uh, indicator that it's uh, you know the right point of the season for planting those heat-loving things. But if you're planting them under a bit of plastic, you can you can move that. Sorry, I keep getting flies in my mouth. Uh, you can move that ahead a couple weeks. Um, so. I'm going to take one of my domes, probably the one that's over the garden I just showed you because it doesn't really need to be covered anymore, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to take that dome and I'm going to put it here. And uh, I'm just going to make little circles. Boy, this soil is warm. Um, so I've had plastic over this garden for weeks just warming the soil up, so it's good and warm. That's another thing I do. Um, anywhere I'm going to plant... Uh, cucumbers I put some sort of plastic over the soil for about two at least two or three weeks before I want to plant to really heat it up right anyway I'll make a circle like that then I'll do another one like here maybe about two feet over another one there and so on all the way down the bed and put uh, two or three cucumber seeds in each of these spots and then I'll put a dome over this or some plastic over to something to, to, to keep it extra warm and to keep the, the cold out at night and uh, usually the seeds <coughs> retain their viability. We've got a couple nights this week where it's going to get down to five or six. But those seeds should, should be okay. Uh, I planted some beans last weekend. We're going to check those in a second um, to see if the seeds are still viable. If I can find the seeds. Um, uh, I always try to plant one crop of beans a little extra early just to see what will happen. Uh, so let's go have a look at that. All right, so I got some... Uh, 
Yeah. This garden's got the. Uh, got here. This garden's got uh, peas down the middle. They're gonna need to be trellised really soon. Um, but I thought I'd put some. I planted some beans uh, last week, in the hopes that I could get them germinated and started. So uh, I, I've got some planted here outside the dome, and some uh, inside the dome under a little bit of mulch. Let's just have a look and see if we can find one. Now it's not it's not good to go rooting around and um, looking at your seeds to see their their stage of germination, but. Uh, it's I, I find I end up doing it anyway just because I'm always curious to see There's a nice worm uh, See what's going on Where are they? This soil is full of worms. Holy smokes <laughs> They're almost impossible to find once you've. Uh, there's one. Okay. Well, it still looks viable. It, ha it hasn't germinated at all, um, but it certainly looks viable. So we'll see. It doesn't look rotten anyway. There's one right there. Yeah. There's no radical coming out of that. So I don't know. I'll give it another week. Basically, if it, <coughs> if it hasn't germinated by next week, it's probably dead. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it looks okay. It hasn't. When the when the when those seeds uh, have lost their viability, they go all mushy, right? Looks okay to me. <coughs> Here's something I also like to do. Uh, so this garden, I've got uh, potatoes planted all around the perimeter here, and then down the center, I've got uh, I've got beans planted under this plastic, right? Because it's still getting cold at night. It, uh, we had a uh, risk of frost the last couple nights, actually. So it's a bit early for beans, but I thought I'd go, I've got more, right? <laughs> if, I, if I find they're not growing next week, I'll just plant some more. Um, but I find this approach it tends to work when you use the plastic. It just buys you more time. So you plant potatoes around the perimeter. They like the rocks. Then in the center, you plant pole beans, you put a trellis, Potatoes grow about this high and the beans grow about six, seven feet high. They get along just fine together and uh, yeah. the one never overtakes the other. The beans, uh, you know, assuming they grow, they, uh, they uh, you know, they grow so fast they get above the potatoes fairly quickly and uh, get, get some height and so they're not competing for light and really not competing for resources. Perfect companion planting. I don't think they benefit each other anyway. They're just, just they just work well to, together. It's a good way of getting two things out of the same space. And what the potatoes do is they provide so much foliage that they uh, smother out weeds and all that sort of stuff. So it works out really well for a garden. So here's an interesting uh, find. So I moved some of this um, arugula. So I've got a, a garlic bed here and there's some spots where the garlic didn't come up. So I moved some arugula to another garden here and it's it's had some damage just from being moved and I think it'll some of it will come back um, but the damage is incredible so this one there's an, a lot of a flea beetle damage on it and this leaf has been eaten there's flea beetle damage and slug damage and this uh, speaks to uh, there was a bit of a myth where people talk about how uh, and, and I used to uh, subscribe to this I used to think it worked but uh, further experience has shown me it really doesn't do anything <laughs> The idea that companion planting uh, greens with garlic uh, prevents pest damage. Um, it doesn't. <laughs> the flea beetles, uh, uh, there's some sort of fly on my lettuce here too. It's not even afraid of me. Get out of there. Um, there's a snail, there's a snail right there, a live snail. Yeah. Um, like the snails, the slugs, the flea beetles, every single pest you can imagine uh, that's attacking this arugula doesn't care about this garlic at all. It's, it's not thrown off by it in the slightest. Um, and neither are these black flies. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> right? So, 
if you're using that approach and uh, and you you think it's preventing pests, it's not. You just don't have a pest problem. <laughs> that would be my advice. So uh, arugula is, uh, generally speaking, uh, m more pest-free than a lot of other plants. Um, I'm guessing. That, so I mean, this garden had uh, I think it had greens in it last year. So it had the sorts of things that I think it might have been a kale garden. I can't remember what was in this last year. I think it was kale. I can't remember. Um, pretty sure it had something in it that these pests like, so they're around, right? Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I'll have to deal with that. I've got a, a pyrethrin uh, spray that I use uh, when necessary to deal with that sort of thing. A couple of shots of that are to uh, even things out. I have one viewer ask me about, I, I, did, I did a video where I was planting these and I had a viewer ask me uh, if I remembered to plant the one that was over here. And <laughs> I, I did after about five hours and it's it's barely visible. I think it's still alive But barely <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, I did remember to plant it But it took another five hours to get to it <laughs> uh, Here's a garden where I planted uh, some beets and uh, you can see I usually sow this time of year I tend to sow a lot of things under plastic. It, it just uh, really improves the speed and the success of germination because it's, it's just overcast here, we don't get a lot of heat. The conditions are aren't ideal for getting things started. Things can take forever to germinate here. Um, so anyway, these, these beets are coming in. Uh, this could use a bit of water. Looks a little bit dry. But anyway, it worked. These were just planted last week and they've already germinated. So that's worked out great. You, you can't see them on camera here because they're tiny, but they're, <laughs> they're definitely up. Yeah, so yeah, I just put these little things, I put a couple of rocks to hold them down. I, I removed them before I made the video. So you know, otherwise these would blow away, right? But these are great. You know, if, if making these hoops is a, a bit of a chore and you don't have no place to store them or whatever, um, these are ideal. And you know, if I could do it all over again, uh, I would have um, all my beds, or a good number of my, let's say a number of my beds, be boxes and I'd make these all the boxes exactly the same size and I would make these plastic rectangle things to exactly fit the dimensions of the box so that they would create a, a kind of a cold frame right I think that would be and then you just put something in the middle to put something underneath the middle to, to pop it up like a dome right um, instead of having to deal with these things it's really, I mean, the domes are really handy because it's basically a portable cold frame and you can get a lot of uh, great results using them. You can plant things really early. I just planted my tomatoes the other day. I direct seeded them. And uh, many people would think that's crazy, planting direct seeding tomatoes outside at the end of May. Um, but if they, if you germinate, we don't get a hard, last year we got a hard freeze uh, around the end of June that killed every tomato I had under plastic. It was that cold. It froze the hose, everything. There was ice on my goldfish pond late June. Um, so uh, barring that contingency, if that doesn't happen, uh, this this totally works. You direct seed them, you do one under plastic, so it's uh, even though it's it's June, from the tomatoes point of view, it's July because it's just that much warmer. There's no wind in, in, inside your gar uh, under the plastic. It just gets so much hotter and it's hotter at night. It's just the kind of kinds of conditions. The soil's the right temperature. Tomatoes get everything it wants. Um, so yeah, I love using plastic. But yeah, if I were to do it all over again, um, the, the boxes and these would be exactly the right size so that it would create a kind of cold frame, right? The soil in my boxes is usually only, at the very most, it's halfway up the wood. So it's usually about three inches of space between the soil level and the top of the box. So if I could put one of these things, which are very light, very easy to store, and perfectly fitted on there, I think that would be like the, the ideal uh, way to get that cold frame effect. For very little cost in a very practical way. I'm out here outside the garden enclosure with the uh, garden extension. <laughs> I've got these log beds here and uh, these rock beds over here. I love the rock beds. Uh, the garden beds are more practical in many ways um, because they're dimensional, but the rock beds, uh, the rocks hold a lot of heat and they look really cool. Um, anyway, this one's got uh, potatoes in it. There's potatoes about six inches deep under, uh, under the soil level and then about six inches of uh, mulch. And the mulch is just uh, 
leaves basically. Uh, this bed and uh, this bed is um, uh, onions, and at the very end I've got um, some uh, squash I've planted. It's called the candy roaster squash, and it's supposed to be really good, sweet tasting squash under these cloches. And I plan to do a lot more with cloches uh, this week. I want to get all my squash sowed this week. So uh, I thought we'd just pop one of these things up and see. Whenever I plant squash, I plant two or three seeds because you never know which ones are going to fail. And then uh, you just sort of pick the, the biggest, the biggest, strongest one to be the winner. But I mean, it's been really cold, and it's the, 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 the kinds of uh, weather conditions we've had are have really not been amenable to squash. It's been too cold for squash. So I'm curious to see the state of the seeds. There's an onion right there. Uh, let me bring the camera over a little closer. Again, generally speaking, it's 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 not good uh, good practice to go digging up seeds and stuff like that. But I find my curiosity often gets the best of me, and uh, plus I got a got a gardening show to run here, so I got to give you some good content. So all in the suspense. I mean, you know, did the seeds make it? Have they germinated? Are they rotten? Tune in next week to see. Uh, so let's see here. Let's just go for blow broke. Oh, here's one, <laughs> after all that. So, despite having some nice beyond freezing, I don't know how well this is going to do now. I've certainly messed it up, but I wanted to show you that it does work. So, after I planted these a week ago, we've had a couple of nights with a frost warning. It's definitely been too cold for planting squash. And these are like, I think it's called Georgia Candy Roasters, so it's a squash from a really hot place. Um, anyway, you can see the radical. And this has germinated and it looks like a viable seed. I don't know what I've done to it by all this digging and probing around. Again, don't do not do that. I'm just doing this because i got to show what I want to show you that these cloches can be affected. It, it has been cold. It has been, you know, close to zero certain nights. And uh, these cloches have, I mean, they basically heat the soil up during the day enough that it, it stays warmer at night than other, you know, adjacent soil. So it's like a like a tiny cold frame. Very easy to store, they fit into one another. Works great for something like this, right? Not so good for plants that are in rows and stuff, but for squash or tomato or something like that, you know, a big bushy plant that takes up a lot of space, it's ideal. Sorry, pal. What I'll, what I'll probably do is Pop a couple more seeds in here, because <laughs> I probably really messed that one up. Anyway, I wanted to. I was, I was keen to see if that was actually there. Well, it seems to have worked. All I've sort of done is uh, to hold this in place. Is put the mulch around it. I left the vents closed and just put a. Seems a bit heavy. Put a rock on top. That seems to work. It's, the thing came with these pins and stuff, but I don't think this is easier. <laughs> it's just a lot easier approach. So, <clears throat> this here whole area in the garden, this is all um, onions. Actually, I can see a footprint. I think a bear or a deer or a coyote is something large enough. It's definitely a footprint here. And I don't walk in these beds. A uh, large mammal walked in this garden uh, very recently, <laughs> from the looks of things. 
Um, anyway, when these start to grow, uh, I'll train them this way, off into here, over the rocks and back into the part. I don't, I don't really come back here, right? And I'll just let them go this way. We'll get lots of sun over here, and I'll, I won't even bother with them. I'll just let them go, and then I'll pick them in October when they're ready to be picked. Uh, this is a potato garden. I just planted potatoes under it. The same as approach as the other one, except here I've used straw because I was able to get some, uh, not straw, hay. Used uh, stable hay. About six inches of hay. Uh, and, the, and the potatoes are about six inches deep under the soil. And finally, uh, I just planted this yesterday. So this uh, is uh, a garden where I plan to grow uh, tomatoes. I find the deer and other things seem to leave them alone. Um, so what I've done here is uh, I've got a combination of leaves and grass. You know, I, I, I get leaf bags off the side of the road. And then what I do when I want them to be this, this kind of fine material uh, is I throw the leaves all over my lawn and mow them up with the grass. And I find it makes it sort of stick make a nice uh, com compactable sort of form so instead of using cardboard between my rows like I do in a lot of other gardens here I just use that that material and pat it down I find it does a pretty good job of suppressing weeds and uh, it also feeds the soil and stuff like that so here I've got uh, I got tomatoes down this row I got tomatoes down this row but down the middle I've planted um, things that go with tomatoes. I've got uh, basil and uh, uh, cilantro, right? Uh, so they'll just, you know, grow, you know, in amongst the tomatoes. Uh, and I could do it in a haphazard way, but I just, I find it's easier to keep things uh, organized that where you know where things are. You know, I don't, I don't put, you know, signs at the ends of my gardens or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, when things start coming in in a row, you, you, you can figure out what it is pretty quickly and you know where everything is. Anyway, so that's just one more example of, of process, right? Uh, I, I moved the soil, uh, I, I sort of, I cleared all the mulch that was on the soil off. I threw all that mulch and some leaves and stuff on the lawn and mowed it up. And then I uh, took some of that material and put it back. And then uh, made little tiny furrow, put my seeds added some good fresh compost on top of there and uh, I'm completely confident in a week or so I'll have a bunch of stuff growing in here anyway just a video on process I gotta wrap this up quick because I can feel my bug dope is uh, wearing off but uh, I find most bug dope no matter what they say they have about like a 30 minutes of really good effectiveness and then the flies just get closer and closer and closer and uh, so right now it's actually I had to uh, reshoot this this wrap up because I swallowed a fly. <laughs> I was coughing and gagging and stuff. Uh, anyway, yeah, there's no breeze right now. It's just unbelievably bad. Anyway, that's my process, and that's how I work work through uh, things in the garden. Uh, I hope that's uh, useful to you and gives you some uh, little tips and tricks and stuff like that. And of course, if you get any any other tips or tricks, uh, let me know what you do. Um, but that's how I deal with uh, the, the lack of sunlight and just lack of ideal growing conditions to. Uh, make things work despite the, the challenges. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.